It's time for the VolQuest podcast, where we dissect the biggest news items of the week. Good Tuesday, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving week, and welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast presented by Smoky Mountain Organics, East Tennessee's most trusted health and wellness store, four locations to serve you, including in Knoxville at 8018 Kingston Pike. It's just down from Trader Joe's across the street from them. Of course, you can shop online at SmokyMountainOrganics.com. They also have locations in Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, and Sevierville, so be sure and check them out. If you're purchasing in-store, mention VolQuest, and you'll get 15% off of your total purchase. With Rob Lewis and Austin Price, I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you along with us. Tennessee wraps up the regular season this week as they take on 2-9 and nine Vanderbilt, 0-7 and seven in the SEC. Rob, when you look at the Commodores, not trying to be cruel, but there's not a whole lot to dive into there that, that they have done this year that's really caught your attention. Bad football team. Who they beat? UConn and, and, and Colorado State by, I think, a combined five points or, <laughs> uh, or, or their wins. And, and just, again, not, I'm not, not trying to be disrespectful, but just, you know, at the bottom of the barrel of the SEC, just about everything, the 15 points a game that is, is the worst scoring offense in the league. That's eight points less. Than the, than the next worst team, South Carolina. That that's a. I don't know that we've ever seen a gap like that. Yeah, it's pretty significant. They, they they've they've certainly struggled in all areas. Although Austin, they show. I mean, they had that as a a touchdown game in the second half against Ole Miss last week. Defensively, they showed a, a little bit more of a pulse last week than they've shown in some previous weeks. Well, they have. Um, you're exactly right. Um, you know, the thing about it with, with Vanderbilt is you just don't see much end in sight either. I mean, they're they're not very good. I, I can't imagine they're going to be a whole lot better next year. So, like, does Clark Lee have the patience there? You know, um, you know, I, I just don't think they're going to be a destination spot for kids in the portal. You know, like, you know, your best kids in the portal are not going to Vanderbilt. Um, so, more than likely, tennis, when Vanderbilt ends up with a decent player, somebody's going to go grab them, you know, from the portal. Uh, and so, uh, you know, they, they have shown more of a pulse of late. But, again, if Tennessee comes out, that's what they're supposed to do early, much like the South Alabama game, then Tennessee should win this game easily. And how, there's a reason they're a 30-point favorite. Sure, sure. I mean, how impressed were you, Rob, with the way Tennessee did approach last week? Not that that was ever truly a, quote, trap game because Tennessee was playing for bowl eligibility. But, but when you look back on the game, how impressed were you with the way Tennessee was out of the gate and ready to go? I thought that was the most impressive thing about it was the way they started off. Cause I mean, and, and we talked about it on here and because, you know, coach Hope, Heupel brought it, brought it up last week. It was going to be one of those games where you had to create, your, you know, quote unquote, create your own juice. And, and Tennessee was able to do that. I mean, it was, I mean, the stadium was half full. If that, it was cold, you know, if you're walking into the game, you know, there, there's just no excitement. I mean, there are, you know, there are fans there, hardcore fans there, but it's not, you know, the tailgate scene was, was really tepid and uh Tennessee didn't let you know any of that affect them I mean you're coming off a run where you played three teams three of your last four games been against top 10 teams and the other one was against Kentucky in a, in a packed house raucous environment up in Lexington and this was this game was not like that and Tennessee was was on point for the jump I mean heck they scored touchdowns in their first seven possessions yeah pretty, pretty good night of offensive efficiency for sure this week marks the, the final game for a, a group of seniors. We don't know exactly who all that's going to be, right? Because some of these guys can come back for their super senior year and, and, and some of those things. But when you, when you look at this group, assuming most of them leave, how should this group of guys be remembered by Tennessee fans? I think that they'll be remembered fondly because, one again, I think – but. Thanks to the SID staff and Josh Heupel, people have gotten to know these kids. You know, how many times has, you know, Jaquan Blakely talked or Matthew Butler talked and, you know, so on and so forth. And you add in Tennessee Prime and other shows that, that the kids have been able to do. I think that the fans know them uh, better than they've known previous senior classes in recent years. And so uh, I think they'll be remembered very fondly because they were kind of the group that everybody left for dead and they kind of, you know, the old Andy Dufresne, they crawled through 500 yards of crap to, you know, to freedom, so to speak. And so I think they'll be remembered fondly, much like, you know, I've said, told this story 
a few times lately. Um, you know, every week when we go to do Tennessee Prime, I go to the bathroom for the show. Um, you know, and above the the toilet there in the bathroom at Gus's is a poster of the '85 Sugar Bowls. And you know, I every week I think you know the next Tennessee team to get to Atlanta or win it win in Atlanta will be like that team. They'll be that that fondly remembered team 30 or 40 years down the line. People will talk about them the way they still talk about Jeff Powell and that 85 Sugar Bowls team. I think they'll be remembered fondly. For, I mean, like you said, AP, because Bill Martin and the Sports Information Department and Coach Heupel have been so good about you know, getting those kids visible. But also, I mean, they stuck around in a day and age where you don't have to. They didn't go to Oklahoma. They didn't go to Alabama. I mean – Maybe Matthew Butler didn't have the same opportunities that Wanya Morris or, or Henry Tooto did, but he could have gone somewhere. You know, same same for all those guys, and they and they stuck around. Yeah, they certainly did that. And not only did they stick around, they bought in. And and and, and I asked this question: If you're a, a a new coach coming in, and I'm not taking anything away at all from what Josh Heupel has done in this day and age. Is it easier to get kids to buy in because they chose to stay when they didn't, when when they had choices not to stay, as opposed to five years ago, Rob, where, where if a new coach came in and you'd left, you had to win an appeal to go be eligible. You felt like you were almost stuck. These guys aren't stuck with the one-time transfer rule. With that being the case, easier to get kids to buy in or harder to get kids to buy in? I think I don't know that it's easier or harder. I think it's more important to sell yourself early because I think I, I bet a lot of guys take a wait and see approach. Like, you know, Hey, if, if I don't like what I'm hearing, I'm, I'm out of here after spring practice. So I think it puts a big burden on, on the coach, new coach and his staff to communicate their vision. So, so you're saying that, that, that coach has got to be more personable than, than previous because it's a different, there's not the weeding out process. It's a different process now because the kids do have options. The kids have all the leverage. Right. I mean, I mean, they have all the leverage. I mean, they can, like I said, they can wait, you know, if I don't like how spring went, I am bouncing. And it's on the, it's on the coach to, I, I don't know. This, uh, you don't do recruit kids anymore, Rob. Can't. <clears throat> no. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting deal because you do, when you come in, you do have to recruit, I guess, as a new guy, you do have to recruit kids, but you have to recruit them through honesty because those kids have, have seen through, most of them have felt burned by the recruiting process because the guy who signed them isn't there anymore. So they're probably looking at it very differently, uh, which again, I guess goes back to the, the best thing Josh Heupel and his staff have done since they've been at Tennessee is, the, is creating the, the, the culture. I hate that word that's overused, but creating the environment that they have and, and showing care for kids beyond, um, you know, just the X's and O's and just the football part of it. And, and as a result, Tennessee's got a chance that to win seven football games in, in the regular season. And uh, who knows, may even be in a Florida bowl game, depending on what happens um, with the rest of the SEC this week. Um, and what's going to be a crazy bowl scenario for, for this for this league with so many teams jumbled up at six and seven wins when it's all said and done. Hubbard, break it down for me, because I know you're all over that. What's this, the bowl scenario? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, it, I think it's a, I think it's hard to break down because – Look, I mean, Florida, if they were to get bowl eligible, is not very attractive. I think we all Ooh. acknowledge that. Nobody's really lining up to say, hey, we want the Gators, right? Same for Auburn at this point. You know, the only attractiveness with Auburn right now is Bo Nix is out there publicly criticizing SEC officials, which I think is a pretty fascinating move by a guy who's, who's not playing the rest of the year. But he's out there questioning the favoritism Alabama's getting by officiating. But, but Auburn's not exactly attractive at, at six and six, assuming they lose the Iron Bowl. So Tennessee, to me, Austin is the most attractive, you know, six, seven win football team out there. Um, then you've got Kentucky. If they win, they become a nine win team, which I think locks them in to, to one of those Florida New Year's Day bowls when it's all said and done, if they win that game. If they don't, I think that opens up the landscape for a lot of different stuff out there. For Tennessee, it feels like a Liberty's out. To me, it feels like it's Music City Bowl in Nashville, unless they can find a way to land in a Florida bowl. You know what? I, I felt like Nashville was kind of like this 
the nice pillow to fall on if Tampa doesn't happen. But something tells me Danny White's going to make a play here. He, he's just come from UCF. He's going to make a play here to get down to Florida, whether it's – it's if it's if Tampa's not the option, does he make a play for Jacksonville? You know, and would Jacksonville take – would the Gator Bowl take Tennessee a third time in, was it, seven, eight years? You know, I, I just feel like ultimately that that – I'm not going to shut the door on on Jacksonville. Like okay. I don't think I think Charlotte is probably not going to. I, I, I think N- Nashville would trump Charlotte. The Vols would end up in Nashville before they end up in Charlotte. And, yeah. I, and you're right. I think they're going to Memphis. As much as Memphis is going to say, "Well, we were robbed last year, and we really want Tennessee," I just don't see it happening. But and uh, if correct me if I'm not wrong, if I'm mistaken, um, Austin, it, Tennessee will submit their basically top three choices. Yes, of where they would like to go, and everybody's going to submit those things, and then that they'll they'll get in a room and argue and debate and a lot of it, straws and- or whatever. <laughs> what do they do from that point? I mean, the day and age of going in and telling you know picking up a bowl executive director and go, hey, we'll, we'll guarantee forty five thousand ticket sales. You can't do those. That's not how it works because it all filters through the league office now. You can't do a whole lot of backdoor. It backdoor does dealings. backdoor channels with the league office. I mean, like it's not the same, same, but it's, there's still some backroom deals cut, I believe, you know, I mean, they all, they all kind of get in there and they're on the big group. I'm being facetious. They're on the big group text and they're all you know, <laughs> jockeying for position, um, you know, but it, I think a lot of this depends on too, Brent. Like what about Alabama? You know, how, you know, if, if Alabama beats Georgia and you have two in the playoff, then how does that shift around somebody potentially, whether it be New Year's Six now dropping down to the the Capital One or whatever it's called now, the Citrus Bowl, um, or or not? You know, I, I just think ultimately whether at Tennessee or uh, whether the SEC has two in the, in the playoff could determine also the pecking order on where things shake out. We'll, we'll have a Hubbard will have a lot more about this in the in the VolQuest email this week, the newsletter, <laughs> in the in the insider email. Yeah, you'll be sending that out, right, Rob? Um, I'll look for you to release that to everybody Friday night about eight thirty. Um, no, be, Hubs, we have we we have Brent or we have Eric and 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 Ben for a reason. They go out like paper boys and they're throwing them, <laughs> throwing them hard copy <laughs> print editions, <laughs> hitting the print edition on everybody's door. I got you. That's that's fantastic. That, that, it, it is going to be. I think the Kentucky game against Louisville is an interesting game for the bowl scenario. And then I think you're exactly right. How many does tennis? How many does the SEC get in the playoff? How does that play out? Uh, will 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 drastically shape the landscape uh, of what the bowl season looks like for for the SEC. It's just a strange year because there's a bunch of teams grouped together in that six and seven win category. Um, that, the whole that, league. That, that's I mean, gonna make give right. me six six or seven and five. And so everybody's trying to figure out who's excited about being six and six and seven and, and seven and five. Now that, that's the that's the that's the best way of putting it. Which fan base is excited to beat seven and five? Yeah, and I think Tennessee, because of the way they played down the stretch, pretty excited. South Carolina, that's a surprise for them to get bowl eligible. Uh, there's, I, I didn't think there was a chance in in hell that Missouri was going to be a bowl eligible team. Uh, Austin, when we left Columbia, Missouri, I I, I, I thought, thought South Carolina was either. I mean, both teams. It was yeah, all. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I just didn't, I didn't see that, but th- there they are, and, and congratulations for both of them being there. Where does that put them? Uh, again, they're just a bunch of teams grouped in at barely bowl eligible. But here's the deal: it, it's as simple as this. If Florida is Florida, both those teams are probably going five and seven. Instead, you know, they're probably going six and six, providing they don't pull an upset this week against Arkansas and or Clemson. Yeah. That is, that's for sure. So we'll see what uh, happens with that. Obviously, Tennessee needs to take care of business uh, against a Vanderbilt team on Saturday that has struggled. And Tennessee has been great in the first, qu- first quarter to start games. Hard to imagine that this Tennessee team is not good in the first quarter this week as well uh, against Vanderbilt and get off to the fast start uh, the way they have the last, uh, really all season long, but in particular the last few weeks. Uh, let, let's, we got to get to some hoops and we got to get to some recruiting stuff. As well, we may circle back to a little bit of coaching search out there just because we like talking about coaching searches when we don't have to chase one of our own. Um, let, let's let's talk a little recruiting. Austin, t- Tennessee, everybody wants to know, you know, when's Tennessee getting another one? When Are they going to get one by December 1st? Are, are they everybody just going to sign on signing day? Finally, Tennessee makes some noise in recruiting. 
Yeah, Joshua Joseph picks Tennessee on Monday, and uh, that's a big, uh, a big kind of uh, momentum builder for uh, the weeks to come. Um, Tennessee's still, I think, in good shape with several guys, Justin Williams. Um, I think they remain, you know, right there. Uh, you know, I don't think that like everybody just assumes Cody Jones is done, and and I think it's you know, sixty forty. Like you know, I, I think Tennessee's moving that direction but it's not done like the kid could end up sticking with michigan and it wouldn't surprise me but like i again like I, that's why I, when i put those percentages out the other day you know you don't you don't ever lock somebody in but i do think tennessee's definitely moving in the right direction there um i, I thought you picked tennessee to get like 10 kids in that in that prediction i thought you had like 50 kids on all of them I, I did not yeah. um but it's even the guy, I, it's the way i read the post austin I, yeah i know justin we <laughs> trust me i know um if you read what you want to read um Justin Williams I put 90 10 just because I mean he's not going to do anything until I think the the you know signing day you know I mean I don't think it's hard to put 100 percent on a kid that's not you know going to pull the trigger between now and and then and and I think he's going to do something on signing day but I still think Tennessee's in excellent shape there and you, uh, you know what do you like about Joshua Joseph's game what, I mean I know Tennessee beats out Michigan I think Kentucky was swimming in there late trying to get yeah, heavily involved yeah, there second for him based on my talk with him Kentucky um, did? Yeah. Okay. What do you like about his game? Well, I, I think he's long. Uh, he's, he's you know, quick twitch, gets off the ball extremely well, and uh, just has, you know, kind of great football instincts. And so, you know, I, I think that the staff really coveted him a lot. If I know the staff feels like if they can find a way to, you know, add to Josh Josephs with James Pierce, that they, they have got – two phenomenally athletic edge guys to build upon, you know, because by the time those kids hit the field, you know, you're looking at, you know, realistically hit the field a bunch. You're looking at, you know, having to replace Tyler Barron and or, you know, Byron Young. So all of a sudden, boom, there's two guys that you feel like can really help you right away. And, and so, go ahead. I was, when I say right away, I mean like right away once those guys are done. So it's like a year from now. Like I think Joseph's could play next year. My point, though, is, is is he going to start next year? Probably not. That's not how really any of these things work, barring, you know, an injury in front of you. And, and Rob, when you look at this Tennessee defense, getting more explosive off the edge has to be priority one. Hugely. I mean, other than, you know, Byron Young coming back, you know, I think Tyler Barron has a chance. But he sort of tell for whatever reason, you know, playing time or whatever, he, he's been – less productive as the season gone, has gone on or shown up less. I don't know if it's a health issue, but, you know, By Byron Young is a keeper. After that, it's hard to point to anybody in this roster and, you know, so that's an explosive edge guy. And Austin, I know we'll have uh, more names of guys who may potentially come in this weekend, but Tennessee hoping to, to, to make a little hay with some, some junior college guys in terms of visits this weekend. Is that still the initial plan? Yeah, that's the plan. I mean, Tennessee wants to try to get in Michael Carraway. He was going to come in last weekend, just couldn't work it out. The kid from Pearl River Community College in Mississippi. He's going to now come in for the Vanderbilt game this weekend. And then Marquis Gilbert, um, kid from Hutch, is going to come in this weekend as well. So, yeah, two two JUCO DBs that Tennessee wants to get in here that, that they like a lot. And so, like, Tennessee's defensive backboard, when you look at it, I mean, it's a big board right now with a month to go. Um, you know, they're wanting to land four, five, six guys, you know, between now and, and then, uh, depending on who they can land. And, uh, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see how all that shakes out. You know, you've got Christian Harrison. Now, you know, now that Florida's making a move, like, where does, you know, where does, where do things stand with him? Um, you know, where do things stand with, you know, a guy like Jordan Thomas? You know, that one just feels like the, tr the there's less traction there now than there was, you know, a month ago. When that's I think the kid that's the kid from Alabama or Mississippi. Yes. Alabama. He's committed to Mississippi State. He's from Alabama. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, and then are they still in it with the the Caldwell kid, Jeremiah Caldwell? That one just feels like Michigan State. But right. again, does the kid look and go, God, I think I just hammered by Ohio State, man. I want to go play in the SEC. I mean, yeah. that's always possible, you know. I mean, and again, he's gonna come down here in December. How does that visit help Tennessee? Do, do they capture the you know the wave you know and ride the wave all the way to signing day with a kid like that yeah he might come down here and it might be a little bit warmer uh but michigan state needs help in the secondary we certainly saw that on saturday so plenty of recruiting stuff going on the portal getting hot and heavy going to continue to get hot and heavy 
with names jumping in there, particularly with all the coaching searches and, and the coaching moves that are, are taking place. So that's another element to the recruiting cycle that we'll continue to follow for you. Certainly we'll have more on who uh, might be in for unofficial visits as well as the official visitors this weekend uh, coming up later in the week. Rob Lewis, the Tennessee basketball team, hard lessons, got exposed against Villanova. They come back and beat a blue blood in North Carolina, who's probably not a great North Carolina talented team right now. And then we've got to figure out how to pronounce Santi's name. That's my three takeaways from the weekend. So give, give me the takeaway from hoops this weekend for you. I mean, I think you just saw the floor of the ceiling. I mean, I, I, is the best way I would describe it. I think, um, you know, Saturday you saw what happens when you have a bunch of veterans that you get, you're counted on no show. And then, Sunday, you saw what happens when those veterans and, and the newcomers mesh and, and put it all together. I mean, they, if, if the one, if, if the bearded biker doesn't come off the bench, North Carolina hit five threes. I mean, Tennessee really runs them out of the gym. Big Was time. he part of the wild hogs? Was he part of the wild hog? <laughs> Doesn't matter. I mean, but he, but, he's the only thing that kept them in it. I mean, yeah. you know, he, he really was. And I mean, I thought the, like everybody else, I was super intrigued by by the, you know, the the Munchkin backcourt of Kennedy Chandler and, and and Zakai. You know, can can you do that every night? I mean, will teams figure out a way to really make you pay for playing two guards that small? I don't know, but it was it was a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, I don't think you can play that twenty eight minutes a game or thirty minutes a game. But how do you not have that in a part of your rotation with those two on the floor at the same time? Because both of them play off each other well. They, both of them don't have to have the ball in their hand all the time to be effective basketball players on the offensive end of the floor. At least that's my takeaway from it. Chandler can play off the ball. Zakai can play off the ball a little bit. To, to me, they can create opportunities together on the floor. Can't play at 28 minutes, but does that not have to be a part of your rotation? But for yeah, me, I think so. And I, I mean – me and you were sitting next to each other in Rick's, you know, media day press conference when he talked about playing them on the on the floor together. And I turned to you and kind of snorted, you know, yeah, yeah, right, coach. And then, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then here we are four games into the season and it's been like the most fun, fun thing that they've done. But I think I don't think it hurts you as bad defensively as a lot of people think, because. I mean, look around college basketball. There, there aren't a lot of guards that you see with the back to the basket game that are going to take Sakai down. I mean, they, they they just don't really work on that all that much. I mean, there are some kids that are more advanced at it, like you know, Jaden Springer last year could have done some of that, but it's that's not a that's not something that a lot of guards spend a ton of time on in practice. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 Rob. Let's get to the real topic at hand here. Santiago, don't call me Vescovi. Vescovi, come on, it's easy. Vescovi. But why are we waiting three years in before we're now doing this? What? I mean, did you – Jared – Jared Guarantano? Jared Tano? Well, same, thing with, <laughs> same thing with him. Go back to the podcast however many years ago, two years ago, whatever. I said the same thing. Why are we waiting X amount of years down the line to now shift everybody? It's like – I just hope Sonny doesn't th start throwing a bunch of interceptions ball. <laughs> I tell you what, he, he didn't throw any interceptions this weekend. He was Tennessee's most consistent basketball player. He was. I mean, he was obviously really good against Villanova. And, and I thought for a guy who scored and, and, and shot the ball as well as he did against Villanova, he, he didn't come out Sunday with, with a bunch of heat checks, Rob, and, and, and force some stuff up. I, th I thought he passed two or three that he, that he could have taken that would have been quality shots. I, I thought he was pretty patient on Sunday, even though he had the big offensive and made you know, some defense on plays. Saturday. Yeah. Made some defensive plays, had a great steal in the backcourt to get Tennessee an easy bucket. And and I give the kid credit. I've been trying to get him out of the starting lineup and get Justin Powell in and get, get Justin Powell all his minutes. And, and Santi's proven me wrong. Although I would like to see what Justin Powell could do if he got, if he put up 17 shots like Santi did on Saturday. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, you know, I, you mentioned the, the the ceiling and the floor. I mean, it is it is Sunday the ba the offensive balance? Is, is that what because we all thought after a few games, all right, this team's going to shoot 43s a night. That's who they're going to be. That's not really what they were on Sunday. I don't know what the final number ended up being. In 20. Three-point shots, 20. There was much more inside-out balance. Is that more what Rick Barnes wants the offense to be with, with that kind of balance, even if you're not as productive as they were offensively? Yeah, and I think part of that is those 40 attempts came with, with Fulkerson not playing. Okay. And so I, I think they're, they're much – they're going through the post much more, you know, in a full, I mean, Fulky doesn't take a ton of shots, but it's going in there. They're, you know, they're looking in there and maybe that creates 
something. But I think more than the three-point attempts, I think what yesterday showed is the pace that Rick wants to play at. I mean, and it's not it's gonna be hard to do that every every game because North Carolina's not afraid of that. They're able to play that way too. And that's you know, that made it a fun way, a, a fun game to watch. But I think the way that Tennessee got up and down the floor, um, was kind of my biggest takeaway for offensive style. And I'm I mean, speaking of those two kids, um I forget how many minutes Zakai and Kennedy played, but it was a bunch. I mean, maybe 50 uh, combined, two turnovers in a game like that. For I mean, for freshman guards that had the ball in their hands all game long, that's that's pretty strong. Yeah, it certainly is. My biggest question about this team remains in the in the post outside of Fulkerson. What are they going to do there, Rob? How do they defend in the post without uh, outside of him? What can they do offensively outside of John Fulkerson with post play? What, what's that going to look like? I mean, I, I want to see more Hunt, Huntley Hatfield. I don't. I mean, I, I thought he played well. I mean, he didn't put he didn't put up big numbers yesterday, but he was a factor. He was active inside. He was active on the glass, and um, you know, to me, I, I I like Olivier. I like him a lot. I, mean, I think he's a quality SEC player. But I, you know, you can't you can't no show like he did against Villanova. You know, zero points, five rebounds. I mean, Tennessee, Tennessee's got to have better than that. If, it, if that's, you know, even something that might happen again against a good team, then, then he's got to come off the bench for you. And the, the ceiling with Hatfield is just so much higher. I get, you know, Rick trusts Olivier on defense more than he does Huntley Hatfield right now. But just, you know, what he can give you when, he, when he's playing well is, is so much more than what Olivier can. Yeah, I think he's a huge catalyst for how far this team goes from a development standpoint. I, I don't mean to sit there and say, well, he's the reason they're going to advance or not advance in postseason play. I don't need to, I don't mean that, but for, for the ceiling for this team to grow, to me, he, he's got to be a huge catalyst and a huge part of that. It, and it, he's just yeah. bigger, more athletic. I'm, I'm not even talking about scoring. I mean, I think if Huntley Hatfield gives you six points, that's that's fine. But if he can, if he knows how what to do on defense and, and you know, plays within himself he's just a better athlete a bigger kid a stronger kid well i know rick barnes went to connecticut uh, knowing and believing they were going to get exposed in some areas they got exposed more than they wanted to get exposed against villanova but they bounced back in a big time way with a win over north carolina now they come home and get ready for that black friday showdown uh coming up with tennessee tech 3 p.m afternoon at 3 p.m and uh, we'll have all that covered for you. Coming hey, Rob, up. we'll need you to be there and not at the West Powell game on Friday. <laughs> yeah. Rob's going to be pre-gaming for West Powell. He's going to be at the tailgate. He's going to have the grill going. Be a, a big night in the Lewis household on Friday night as uh, the West Rebels t- play. There's, Powell, there's one TikTok. Uh, there's that one. I don't know. You guys are old enough. I probably know what TikTok is. But there's that one TikTok. There was a nice barbecue place over um, across from the TV, uh, across from the fair right there at Joe Howie Drive. But there's the one TikTok that, that like has everybody screaming like like a celebrity showing up, and I may do that with Rob. Rob always walks in literally one minute before kickoff. You see him coming down the track. I may film this, put it underneath the TikTok, and put that on the board. Do they throw rose petals at his feet when he walks in? I mean, is this, uh, this is isn't it? this isn't Casey Clawson after the win over uh, Florida before the before the game with LSU in 01. Uh, stop in, say hello, visit with my guy Rob Peace for a minute in the corner when when. That now that Harden Valley is, is done for the year, it's, it's a Friday tradition. Now that, he, now that he's made his hire over there. <laughs> and he'll roll, roll in for a, uh, for a big high school showdown for a trip to uh, the state championship game coming up on Friday night. So, anyway, basketball coming up Friday afternoon. Tennessee and Vanderbilt coming up Saturday afternoon. Plenty of recruiting, uh, and that will continue throughout the rest of the week as well as uh, everybody enjoy uh, Thanksgiving. We'll have the mailbag podcast for you on Thursday morning. So you can, while you're deep frying your turkey or whatever you're doing for your Thanksgiving festivities, we'll have that for you to listen to. Maybe you're putting up your Christmas tree and you're not like Austin Price and put yours up on uh, October the 24th. Uh, Maybe you're going to do that. You can listen to the podcast while you put up your Christmas tree on Thanksgiving day or whatever it is for you. So we'll have the mailbag podcast for you on Thursday, as well as the matchup piece to get you ready for Tennessee and Vanderbilt full coverage throughout the week for both Tennessee basketball, football, and recruiting. That's going to do it for this edition of the Smoky Mountain Organics podcast. For Austin Price and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everybody. You've been listening to the Ball Quest podcast every week here on Ball Quest.